This is the Skin Science Podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and here we'll investigate everything skin science and dissect it from a scientific perspective, analyze it from a medical perspective, critique it from a consumer perspective, and give insight from an industry perspective. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and I am joined today by Angela McDonald. She is back, um, back from all of her excursions. Good, bad, or otherwise. Yeah, I'm where back. you were just in Barcelona. I was. I was. Um, wonderful vacation with the kiddos. Mm-hmm. Uh, normally, it's a boondoggle, nah, which is a word that nah. an- I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's the word Angela she taught me. She's working very hard she overseas, typically works. but this was just for she, fun. She knows that the uh, the boss is going to see mm-hmm. this. This is true. Uh, this but is we're true. also joined by Dr. Brian Jones. Who has not been in Spain. Who has not been in Spain, <laughs> who probably would love to be. But familiar with boondoggles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right. All right, um, so Dr. Jones, anything exciting happening uh, lately with you? No, not that I can recall. I got my son back from Europe. He got stuck, so I guess he had this some issues as towards, but uh, no, everything else has been pretty good. Was he in Spain? No, he was in uh, all through Brussels and Paris, and then got stuck at some music festival and got sick. Well, oh, well. If it's stuck, a music festival would be a good place to be. That's true, uh, but then he's probably really tri- tired afterwards. Anyway, we're joined in the back of the room by our peanut gallery. I should probably stop referring to them as that, but yes. uh, we got Jose Maldonado, Dr. Maldonado. Uh, who is our, our producer, uh, works with us in medical affairs. And then we've got Seti and Alan, uh, who are the uh, production team at uh, Media World uh, here in Dallas, Texas. So um, as I promised a couple of episodes ago, I wanted to start out our podcast with one of my kind of hobbies and passions. I, I, I brought another one of my puzzles, and this one is also by uh, the same designers last time. Uh, it's by uh, Tyler Williams at uh, Beards Wood Company. Uh, And this one is called the Idiot Box, which is what my dad used to call the TV when I was growing up. And uh, you may not appreciate it through the camera, but in person, the woods that he uses, the woods that he uses is uh, pretty extraordinary. He uses different types of woods and it's quite beautiful. I haven't actually had time to sit down and uh, to uh, solve this yet, but I wanted to share uh, that with uh, you on uh, the podcast. And I probably will make a video of me solving it and putting it on my website, dochitchcock.com, so if you're interested at all in puzzles, which I am. And that's enough of that. Let's but get it, into it. will be tr- time lapsed. It will be time lapsed. <laughs> <laughs> How long will it take you to finish? That, uh, you know, some, these, some of these take me a few hours. And so I, I do cut and make and speed up. Sp- parts and stuff. And yeah, but, I don't know. We'd, we'd be entertained for a few hours. Well, Talk about the idiot box. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you, there's actually, the reason I got even into puzzles is because um, I started watching videos of people solving puzzles, and I was so enthralled by watching people solve the process of actually solving a puzzle. Of thinking through it. Of yeah. thinking through yeah. it. And I decided I'd had to have these puzzles myself and to do it myself. And so now that I'm doing it, I kind of want to do the same for other people, which okay. is like show them the thought process because... These are not cheap. You know, this one costs, I think, over $400. Mm-hmm. And so some of these are expensive and not everybody can afford the luxury of, you know, these novelties. And so um, I think some people find pleasure in watching Others other people. Think it through. Yeah. And thinking along and with you. And huh? talk to the yeah. TV like, okay. you that should do sense. this or this. And I've seen people leave comments like, you should use this part of it to open this part. And it's actually kind of a little, there's a little like a uh, group of people that, have like uh, Collaborate collaborations on, and stuff. Yeah. It's actually like a little community. Very nice. So yeah, well, so thank it's you for it's a hobby. Us on puzzle boxes. Yeah, and I'm gonna bring one every time. Yeah, <laughs> we can't wait. We can hardly wait. Okay, that's what we call sarcasm. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, so let's get on to the topic of today's podcast, which is something that our listeners are probably very familiar with. I would say so. And that is collagen. So collagen is a word that uh, is like, when I hear it in marketing, it's like scratching nails down Mm -hmm. a chalkboard to me because of the reasons we're going to talk about today. Yep. And part of that is because there's so much kind of marketing-driven misinformation uh, that you find in advertisements, in um, even in scientific talks Mm -hmm. at times, that leads people to such confusion about what collagen is, how it's made by the body, whether you can use it as a supplement, 
uh, those different things, uh, mm -hmm. those different areas of, of uh, information. And so I'd be curious to hear from both uh, Dr. Jones and yourself what, it, what you think of when you hear collagen, because for me, you guys know that I react that way, especially when I hear people say things like, it helps make new fresh collagen. Mm -hmm. And we've mentioned stuff mm -hmm. like that before in the podcast. But what oh, do you think, boy, Angela? I've had that conversation with you so many times. <laughs> well, I'm sure I biased you slightly. You know, I'm, I, you know again, because I haven't been here in a while, I come from both the consumer perspective, um, because I'm the target uh, demographic for such products that mm -hmm. would... Um, that would target collagen, you know, because I'm just now getting to that aging process. I'm just now, <laughs> don't laugh. In five or so years. <laughs> Stepping yeah. into that uh, arena. Yeah. So, um, you know, but I'm also industry. So what mm -hmm. I know of collagen, I know from the devices that we sell in particular, and that is that collagen's a protein in the skin. Um, and the dermal layer of the skin that we uh, that declines, that we lose, that degrades as we age, and when it does, it results in fine lines and wrinkles. And so, in our industry in particular, what we're always looking for are ways in which to increase collagen to fight the aging process. Um, so, you know, and I have to admit, when I walk through the store and I see supplements that say collagen, or um, drinks that say collagen, or you know. You know I, I'm, I'm often perplexed myself, knowing what I know from our industry. It's like, how could that possibly be? So this is a really mm -hmm. fun topic for me to dive into and hear more from a scientist perspective. You know, is it truth or, or is it not? Or is it some of both, right? Some of both, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, what do you think, Brian, when you hear the word collagen in any context, kind of, and you can use different contexts, what do you think? What is it, what's your reaction? Well, uh, again, uh, if you go back to the history as far as how it was named, I think it's uh, for Kala's glue, I believe, and gin mm -hmm. is gener uh, generation or, or, to, or to produce. So it's producing glue, I guess, is how it was originally thought to, to hold the skin together or hold the tissues together. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, I guess when you think about it also going along the history is that, uh, um, you know, really it produced a lot of, uh, you know, data and a lot of knowledge regarding biology and chemistry as well. There was, I don't know if you know, but there was three Nobel Prizes that were given out based around work on collagen. No, I did not know that. So, yeah, so Linus Pauling, uh, big guy in vitamin C, mm -hmm. uh, he, he received it. Uh, Ramachandran uh, received one. And Francis Crick, uh, as towards Watson and Crick, as towards DNA helix, is uh, also. What works. years were those? Do you recall, Brian? Mid, uh, early or late forties, early fifties. Okay. When you were in, in elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Very funny. Everybody uh, knows that's not the truth. That's not the Thomas. truth. That's not. That's when your grandmother was in elementary school. <laughs> um, so yes, that's very interesting, Brian. Um, I didn't know that all three of those had won Nobel prizes based on that. Well, uh, um, Paul, Alliance Paul got his in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ramachandran got his actually on collagen and the um, helix structure. And then Francis Crick, uh, he didn't, I mean, he did his work on helix structure and, and as well. Um, so again, there's... So I guess that, that kind of, just for the, the listeners at home, helix structure. And so when we think of DNA, everybody knows kind of just from, you know, common mm -hmm. knowledge that DNA has like this helical structure. Yeah. Uh, you see it in movies when they when they portray DNA. The triple helix. For, the, yep. Yeah, the yeah. double helix versus. Yeah. Well, double helix for DNA. For DNA, and, and then the triple, triple helix, helix for, for collagen. Correct. And so collagen is made up of several subunits, depending on the type of collagen. And so there's a helical structure as well, right. and then there's sub structures and Correct. such. So we're, I know we're getting probably faster under this more more well, detail really than we're talking about. This is fine. This is fine. <laughs> and so I, I think, um, but that's kind of where, so the vitamin C that you mentioned, uh, I'm assuming it's due to the production of collagen via vitamin C. Correct. And uh, Linus Pauling was really big into that. He took huge doses. He said it was the uh, anti-aging mm -hmm. um, miracle. Just uh, it out. So he would take, I believe, like 30,000 that's a you, lot. Yeah, uh, units, units a day. A I mean, just a huge number. Wow. Um, he, he lived pretty old, but uh, he didn't live forever. So. And yeah. how did he look is the question. <laughs> well, well, he got Google. old. <laughs> Looked yeah. his age? Yeah. Okay. So, so that's the thing is, you know, a lot of people um, try to, they think there's some sort of magic mm -hmm. button, right? Um, and so vitamin C we know is a water-soluble vitamin that if you take a lot, you're just going to urinate most of it out. You're going to pee it right out. Uh, and so the question has been, can you take too much vitamin C? What's kind of, uh, should you saturate your body? Because mm -hmm. then you hit your kind of most that you can have. 
Um, and so there's been some studies on whether there's deleterious effects of vitamin C, whether onto your kidneys, because that has to filter that out to urinate it, um, things of that nature. But also just the premise of there is no one substance known that you take it and it just fixes everything else, right? So there are genes th that are associated with aging and such that we know that if you upregulate them, um, they're associated with maybe more, more collagen or better skin or longer life. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that scientists a lot of times do a lot these types of studies in isolation and they're looking at one or two variables and there's a whole slew of variables that make our bodies function. And so it, it, you can't just change one thing and everything fall into place mm -hmm. because when you're younger, you metabolize things different than when you're older. And so although you might get some benefit both ways, younger or older, it doesn't mean that when you're older, you're going to have as much benefit or the same type of benefit. Uh, and it doesn't mean it's going to stop you from aging. It doesn't mean it's not healthy. It means keep taking it. But it's not like you kind of ingest said, mm -hmm. well, how did he look? The fact is he to Brian's point, probably still looked old, mm -hmm. yeah. but he may have looked better for his yeah, age than have. he would have. Yeah. You don't know Fair because enough. you're not, you're only one person. You can't split yourself into two, study one that doesn't take collagen and one that does. Well, and there's all those other factors, which I know you're about to get into as we talk into, about collagen. It's like, what else was he doing? And some of the things he was doing might've been deleterious to, yeah, that's to right. collagen. That's so right. So he might've been negating sun, some you know? of the benefit mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. and you know, back in that day and age, they didn't have the information that they have now that's on correct. aging, right? So you're right. My have mm -hmm. been excessive sun exposure not understanding at mm -hmm. that time exactly what that was doing to the aging process yeah and it's multifactorial and so you, you want to make sure you're addressing different aspects of either aging or disease in order to truly get a benefit and so back to the vitamin c though interestingly you know i first kind of was introduced to the concept of connective tissue being tied to vitamin c when i was doing my postdoctorate and you've heard this story uh several mm -hmm. times because i did my postdoctorate in tissue engineering and so what we were doing in the lab, and this was at Yale under Dr. Laura Nicholson, who's one of the world kind of leaders in, in cardiovascular tissue engineering. Uh, she also has a company now. Company now. Um, but we were taking, we were attempting to uh, make uh, small diameter blood vessels. And so they had in the past been able to use, they would isolate smooth muscles and they were able to make large diameter, diameter blood vessels, but not small diameter blood vessels. And uh, one of the things you have to be cognizant of when you're trying to make a tissue is that you have to have the robustness uh, in order so that, it, for instance, a blood vessel, you have pressure from the fluid going through. And if it's not completely uh, sealed, you know, it will It'll explode leak. or yeah. leak, you know. And so you'll have an aneurysm and the animal that you implant it into will die, whether it's an animal or a human. So in order to properly do it, you have to make sure it has because uh, you're taking cells and you're putting it onto a scaffold and then those cells populate the scaffold and then they produce all these extracellular proteins, which uh, to those who are not familiar with the jargon are the proteins and, and, and sugars and other things that make the scaffold in which the cells live. And so in the dermis, we know that the dermis of our skin is made up of mostly scaffolding, mostly it's, um, uh, it's tissue that is not living. It is deposited there to be the house uh, or the structure, um, so like the scaffolding of a building. And there are cells, live cells in there, like immune cells and fibroblasts that make, make the structure. But overall, like the, the epidermis is very densely packed with cells, not as much structure. And then the uh, dermis is mostly structure. And so for a blood vessel, you have to have that structure as well as the cells because you have to be able to uh, keep that blood in, that high pressure mm -hmm. blood in. And so what we found, or what, what, we, what they knew already, was that in order for you to produce collagen, or to have those cells produce collagen, the growth media had to have both copper and vitamin C, because copper is, uh, is um, a catalyst for uh, the enzymes that make uh, the collagen, and then the vitamin C as well is required for that. And so, um, you know, I knew that if you don't, if you forgot to put one of those in, you would not be, the cells would just fall off the scaffold and just go to the bottom of the bioreactor and just sit there and they'd still live, but they wouldn't function to make mm -hmm. extracellular matrix. Yeah. For the maturation, correct? That's it? correct, yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, the other thing was, and as far as age, just to kind of finish out the story, uh, is that we, we also, um, what we were doing was trying to find out ways in which we could go into an operating room. Uh, people who were having surgery for like a bypass or something for their heart, if they had a heart, a heart attack or something, had a clog there, is can we grow them another vessel 
uh, so that they, we can have something ready for them to do the bypass because right in, in at the time, you'd have to go get the saph in his vein so they'd have a huge gash on their leg as well as having the open heart surgery. And so the, the thought was, can you make it easier for a patient to have kind of an off-the-shelf type of uh, vessel? And so the problem is most of the people having heart attacks are not young people. And so we would harvest these saphenous veins from older people and then we'd take off we'd scrape off the, sm the smooth muscle cells and try to grow the arteries uh and what we would find is that when you're older you just don't secrete enough collagen mm -hmm. to make a viable artery so i had to do some gene therapy to make them young again et cetera, et cetera. and we won't get into all that but the point there is that we added vitamin c and copper just like we were required to but the older people's cells simply were not genetically able to produce enough of the collagen to compensate for the, the age of the cell, the genetic age of the cell. When I was able to genetically reverse the age, it was then able to produce younger, and we were able to make a robust um, vessel and implant it into an animal. And I believe we were the first to be able to do that, and it's, it's published in the literature. So, Well, can you genetically reverse my age? <laughs> That's another podcast. <laughs> uh, so you know, we, we Let's did do that one. We did talk a little bit about that a couple, a few podcasts ago about senolytics yeah. and being able to do that. And that is something that I'm currently researching, um, you know, and, and interested in. But for today's purposes of talking about collagen, I do want to bring it down to, you know, uh, co what is collagen? How does our body produce collagen? Um, you know, what are the, what are the forms of collagen? And when people talk about collagen, you, you don't really hear it used in a specific term. They, they say collagen as if in all collagen being the same. It's the same, right. Right. You don't hear them saying the good collagen or the bad collagen or the scar collagen or the healthy collagen. Um, you do in certain, um, places or in mm -hmm. certain wheelhouses or what's the word. Um, so I guess let's start with that. Let's start okay. with what is collagen? We talked about the, the structural form of collagen, bit, yeah. right? So you have anything to add to that before we move on past that? Um, no, we can, we can keep going. Okay. I, mean, I know we've already kind of went into that in pretty good detail. So. Okay. And so I guess what we should probably uh, now touch on is that there are many forms of collagen. And so a lot of times people have enough, you know, especially in our industry, they have enough... Um, education either via, you know, hearing their colleagues say it or, you know, formal education to know things like growth factors. Mm -hmm. And they'll hear something like EGF or FGF, which are two different types of growth factors that humans create. But what they don't realize is that <laughs> the human body and human genetics are way more complicated than a lot of them know. There's reasons why people get doctorates in genetics, mm -hmm. because even a person that's a do uh, doctor of genetics doesn't know everything about genetics. They have to, you know, simplify. They have to stick to a very uh, small in one area. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And so, somebody who's a clinical geneticist may not be a molecular geneticist. And there's plant genetics, there's human genetics, there's bacterial genetics or microbial genetics. And even within those fields, there's niches. And one of the things you learn when you're coming up through the basic sciences, and especially when you're in grad school and such, is that even the same genes in the same person can have different forms at the end product because there's something called splice variants. And what that means is basically like, uh, like the old film days where they would take the film from uh, a canister and mm -hmm. to, to edit it. Now we do it on computers, but they used to edit it by actually cutting the film and taking out the part that they didn't want. And that's where you hear when it ended up on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. That's what that comes from because they would cut that piece of film out and then drop it on the floor and then tape those two pieces together and that's splicing that film back together. And that is exactly what happens in our bodies all the time is that we can have a gene and the body, depending on the need or the situation, can actually take the RNA that makes the, uh, the, the protein and it, it can slice out different, we have exons, I'm, get, I'm getting too granular there. So we have different parts that the body can choose which ones to take out and keep in. And so they call those splice variants. So you can actually use the same gene and upregulate the same gene 
but have different, different end proteins mm, okay. based on the splice variant. Right. Well, my actual doctor is in part of that is towards the splice sites. I'm looking at mutations at the splice sites leading towards cancer. Interesting. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm not going to get into details of that, but again, um, a lot of the cancers are actually because of splice variants as far as mm -hmm. mutation at that point where they no longer splice at that point and make a longer non-functional protein. Um, so so they're, they're longer than they should be correct. so they don't fold correctly. Correct. Yeah, and that's the other thing is that a lot of people um, haven't, that haven't been trained up through molecular biology, don't, when they, th and they hear the word protein, what do you think when you hear the word protein? Like, if you visualize what a protein looks like, what do you think I it think looks like? I think of fibers. I think of like, um, I think of connective tissue almost like fibers of something that is either providing a scaffolding, like a scaffolding type of okay. look. Or I think of even connective tissues, like when you think of scars and the connective tissues are, are kind of weighing down the skin to produce a scar. I think that's what, what I visualize, right or wrong. That's what. Well, it's the, not wrong. It's what, right what and it's right and wrong because there are different forms that proteins can take. Mm -hmm. And so connective tissues like collagen and such, they can be very fibrous in the way that mm -hmm. they're uh, created. But a lot of proteins, especially things like enzymes, they okay. have, they're actually, they come out in a string because it's an amino acid sequence. And then the body folds them into a certain configuration and it's super important to fold them the right way because we have uh, certain domains that are active domains. Those are the domains that actually do the work or bind to something. And then you have other domains that are more structural in nature. And what he's talking about is that if you change the way that a protein uh, or a RNA uh, piece of your genetics is um, transcribed and you change a splice variant or something of that nature, you end up with a longer protein than you're supposed to, and then the way it can't fold it correctly. Mm. And so That's where you get the mutations, and, and that can lead to well, things. it leads to a, a, fun, a non-functional protein mm. sometimes. And if a protein can function, then you have a syndrome of some sort or a disease of some sort, um, or you can truncate it too short, yeah. and then it can't fit in the right place, or it's overactive because the um, you know maybe the active motif is exposed, so it's interacting with too many things. So this is one of the things that when people hear. Uh, when they talk about proteins and growth factors and even collagen, I don't think people under uh, or appreciate because, nor should they have a reason to, the nuances of those things that drive the importance of genetics as well as uh, other functions of the body. And that's why we were talking about with vitamin C, it's the same with what we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, which is trying to take a collagen supplement and knowing that just taking one thing can be used by the body in many ways, depending on a lot of other variables. Like, you know, are you going into the sun or, uh, for the vitamin C or, you know, uh, you know, or is your diet crap? You know, are you eating a lot of sugar? <laughs> Who would do that? Right. Who would do that? No, I, I'm a, I can't I imagine. A, I have a horrible sweet tooth. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so uh, Brian, tell us how many forms, well, actually we already talked about it, so I'm not gonna ask you to guess. Um, how many forms of collagen are there um, in the body? Is it, is it more than five? Yes. Is it more than 10? Yes. Is it more than 20? Yes. Is it more than 100? Not that we know of. Okay. That's a, that's a really <laughs> Not that great we know answer. Of. Okay. How many do we know of? I believe it's 27 or 28 at this point in time. I believe it's 28. You're, and so of those, um, is there any categories that you would put them into? Because, um, you know, people might kind of be thinking, oh heck, there's 28 different at least types of collagen. What does that even mean? Like, are they all found in humans? Are these found, where are these found? Well, I guess, uh, you know, the 27 or 28 uh, are found in, in humans, but they're found in different uh, parts of the body and have totally different functions depending on what they're trying to, to do. Um, so it can go from anywhere from, um, you know, uh, connecting two different types of, of tissues together. It could be uh, cushioning, essentially joints, Mm -hmm. uh, it could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, also within the tissue or within the cell as towards providing structure and, and uh, also leading, uh, there's neuronal uh, uh, collagen that actually helps in regarding uh, formation of neuronal tissues uh, along with skin and the like. So again, there's a lot of special uh, specialization that comes along with these different uh, collagens. Um, there's about uh, half a dozen that are found in, in human skin. Um, but they're found in different locations, and they, again, have different functions. Right, and uh, we'll talk about some of those functions in a bit, but one of the things that I think we should talk about is um, the difference, the differences that consumers and people that are not scientists may not appreciate between animal collagens and human collagens. 
um, or just animal proteins and human proteins in general, because uh, you, you know, we always are looking at publications where they'll do animal research or research on animal cells or mm -hmm. something of that nature, and we 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 can draw some conclusions. Um, but if I'm to tell you, for instance, that uh, you know, you know, certain collagen is super important um, or does something in an animal you know, and I, I give you that's a publication in Nature or, you know, some high-end journal. And I tell you that, Angela, what's your response? Do you believe it? Do you think I need to go out and buy that collagen and eat it? Like, what's the response say you get? Say the question again. So if, if I give you a publication where, let's say, you know, they find that in a, in a mouse, collagen, you know, three is um, super important uh, when, they feed, uh, when they feed the mouse uh, collagen three from their own genetics. So they, they make their the genetics from the mouse and they put it into somewhere to isolate that particular protein and they feed it to the mouse that the mouse, you know, lives twice as long. What is the, in your mind, what does that translate to as a consumer? If that's put across the news, you know, that mice live twice as long if they eat their own collagen three protein. And is it suggesting that we would also ingest mouse protein or is it just suggesting that? But that's, you know, that's the question for um, you is how would, how would the consumer, you know, because of course there'll be a physician or somebody on the news that would probably give their blurb about what they think that means. I would say that if I heard that, I would say, well, how do I get that collagen three? If that's the case, if those mice are living longer and looking younger, longer, mm -hmm. then how would I get that? And that I would be left with a question mark. So then I would probably step out into the market and try to find ways that I could also have access to that collagen. Not necessarily for mice, but <laughs> um, collagen three or whatever type of collagen that they were you know, reporting in that. So you're saying that collagen three is collagen three is collagen three, whether it's mice, you know, aardvark, human. Potentially, but I don't think you can, in my mind, you can't cross species. So I would think I would be looking for something that could create that same effect in me that was created. I'm talking about to collagen. ingest it. To ingest it. Yeah. So like, because uh, you can eat mouse collagen or you can eat like cow collagen. Well, the you truth know, is we eat animal proteins. Mm -hmm. We drink animal proteins. Right. And we do increase muscle, for instance, when we take in protein. So those those proteins do have an effect on our body. So yeah, maybe I w it would be. I would just be looking for some type of collagen three and I would be looking at the different sources so you and look opportunities. So you say like, if the steak is rich in collagen three, I'm gonna look for the steak and yeah, start eating I the steak. Yeah, I think that's the, uh, if I didn't know better, I think that's the mindset that I would go with. Okay, yes. Brian, what do you think? I think- Well, he knows better. Well, that's why I'm asking <laughs> him. <laughs> well, uh, again, the, the the, it may be collagen three, but there may be slight variations as towards between different species to species as towards uh, the actual structure and the protein sequences. Um, and what does that mean for like the general layman? Like, well, again, if you're just talking about diet where it gets digested and gets broken down to individual peptides or, or, or single peptides or, or you know uh, combinations of peptides, um, it no longer means anything whatsoever. It all becomes no different between you know the, the source. But if you're trying to find something that um, you know, as a longer version or a longer uh, protein, then you're not getting it through, uh, you know, food sources. So, again... Meaning uh, you can't digest a large protein. It has to be broken down to the building blocks. Correct. Or, or smaller, uh, small blocks. Pieces. Pieces, yeah. yeah. So just for those who uh, may not know, again, the jargon... Um, when we talk about proteins, it's going to be that complex amino acid structure that's folded, mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's that over that's the that's what we consider a protein. Um, when you get to us now, there are certain proteins that are very small. There are certain ones that are very large. Um, so you know, there, when you think of a protein, you might think of the same image, but the fact is, there's an array of sizes. There's huge proteins and very small proteins. But once you get to a certain size of amino acids, a certain number of amino acids on a certain sequence or string, then we just call them peptides. Mm -hmm. And so if you've ever heard of a peptide serum or something, mm -hmm. it's because it's sh too small to be considered a protein, but the same building blocks. But it's the same. And then amino acids is the building block. So each amino acid, uh, there's, there's uh, amino acids that actually uh, the DNA translates into, and then the sequence of amino acids make the overall protein. They have different properties that can attract or repulse certain things, and that's why certain proteins can do certain things because of the sequence of their amino acids. So a peptide is just a smaller version of a protein. Okay. Um, so 
with what Brian said, that is absolutely correct. And I and a prime example of the fact that a collagen three is not a collagen three, or a human collagen is not a mouse collagen, or is not a, a cow collagen, is uh, uh, a dermal filler called Bellafil, mm -hmm. uh, used to be called Artifil, and before that, Artical, uh, actually is in bovine collagen, because originally a lot of fillers were trying to be collagen. Yeah. And so uh, the problem with collagen is, although a lot of people liked kind of the feel and the uh, way it extruded and stuff or went through the needle, they didn't like the fact that people have allergic reactions because some people are allergic to foreign uh, molecules or foreign proteins. And so uh, people would actually have adverse reactions to it because it was cow collagen. And so um, then they had to go ahead and get uh, allergy tests before they would get injected, and it become very cumbersome. And so that company still sells that product, um, and you know they probably would like to change it, but they've got like five-year clinical studies that they've invested millions of dollars into, and so they they keep it as is. Um, however, that's just an example. But what the audience should know is that um, in science, a lot of times when you do animal studies the findings will translate into a human, uh, meaning if we find that, let's say, F, uh, e FGF, one of those growth factors, actually causes a certain thing to happen in a mouse model, it's likely, a lot of times it can translate to the human, you also see similar stuff in human mo uh, cell models, but it doesn't as much go in the opposite direction. So I can take in, ma I'm s okay, I said that incorrectly. Yeah, it goes the other way around. Yeah. So you can take a human uh, FGF and put it into a mouse, and it would work. Usually. But you can't take the mouse, mouse and put it into the human okay. model, and it would work. Okay. And, so, um, and so that's where um, sometimes it breaks down slightly because we don't understand there's small nuances. And when we talk about collagen, I wanted to say all that because I want to talk about the fact that we don't typically go out and find human collagen sources. Like, we don't... We're not ingesting we're not other... We're not uh, yes. anybody anytime soon. Uh, right. We're using it as a source. Now we're that's so, so the green or something like that. But yeah. Okay. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, there's there's a lot of, like, um, synthetic biology happening where someday somebody might make, like, a yeast that produces human collagen. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there enough benefit to collagen supplementation to make it worthwhile? Mm -hmm. Now, for a filler, maybe, you know, because it, right. it might be better. Well, they're also trying to do that now for, trying for individuals who are vegetarians as far as being able to put that into plants. And so uh, trying to make human collagen so that they're able to ingest it um, so that they're able to be able to have collagen in their diet right. without breaking their vegan whatever. It's just per, per, uh, philosophy. Yeah, philosophy, I yeah. guess. Or principles. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's move on to uh, collagen uh, as far as supplementation um so i mean what do you think should we should we should we first well, talk more about how it works in the body let's talk about um we, i think we have a basic college and definition or do yep. we want to just get everybody on the same page and agree on a basic college and definition and then what degrades collagen that's something okay. we haven't talked about yet either and then go into what could potentially change collagen okay. how about that sure so I think we've defined collagen. Okay. Um, now, it's a structural protein, meaning, you know, typically collagen is not, there's different proteins, some are enzymes that cause, you know, reactions of sorts. Collagen is not typically reactive in the sense that it causes a reaction to occur. It's typically a structural protein. And we, we've kind of covered that with, uh, in the skin, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's uh, structural in the sense that it makes up the bulk, the um, strength. Uh, of the dermis. So the skin's strength and structure comes from collagen. Okay. We have other things like elastin that gives it more stretch or bounce back. Uh, we have um, things like hyaluronic acid that gives it, you know, it's um, uh, not moisture. Well, hydration. Hydration. Yeah, like <laughs> Glycaminoglycan, yeah. Yep. And we have other glycosaminous glycans yeah. as well. It's right. not just hyaluronic acid, even though that's the most famous mm -hmm. because of skincare. But um, we may want to talk about that a little later on as well. Okay. But anyway, all right. We'll, so we'll keep on 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 collagen on first. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when we think about the structure of collagen in the in the dermis, though, if we stick to just skin, he mentioned that there's a few types in just the skin, but there's also types in the rest of the body that bind the rest of our connective tissues as well. So, for instance, the tendons and the ligaments that hold our bones and our muscles to our bones um, together. Um, are very fibrous, col collagenous and fibrous from, from different types of collagen. 
Um, the, we don't just have collagen in our skin. We also have collagen that ties our skin down to the bones of our face and to other parts of our body. So there's actually legitimately filamentous or, um, little anchors like of different parts of our skin to different parts of our skeleton, um, as well as to the muscle. We have fascia, what they call fascia above and below muscles that coats the muscle and attaches muscles to muscles and muscles to uh, skin and, and other things to kind of keep things in the right place. And so if you ever watch a surgery, you can watch a physician or a surgeon do like what they call blunt dissection, where they can actually, without cutting, push apart different things because they're actually taking the collagen and just forcefully separating it. Um, and ho hoping that once they uh, put it all back together in the right place, hopefully, uh, that the fibrosis, which is what we we hear, uh, which is scar tissue formation, um, will actually adhere those things back together. Um, so, you know, and I guess I should um, step back a little bit and think, is fibrosis always in a description of scar tissue or is fibrosis also describing just collagen formation through um for instance you, if you get an injury you're going to create collagen then it's not so, necessarily scar tissue is that still fibrosis well if you have like an osteocyte or something like that that would be more towards bone yeah and they actually can produce collagen as well and if they overproduce it as towards an injury towards a, a, a bone would that be fibrosis that'd be fibrosis that's a that's a good point so i guess that's where Typically, when we hear the word fibrosis, we think of an injury producing a scar tissue. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not sure if there's another way to describe collagen deposition in a normal fashion other than fibrosis as well. Um, probably is. Fibrogenesis or something like that, or collagen, collagen, collagenesis. Well, that's sort of just, the word? Well, just a normal production, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is it collagenesis? Is that a word? I believe there, it yeah, is. Guess, All right. Can yeah. you just say collagen deposition? You could, but there's a there's a there's, a, there's, there's a, another there's word, a term, technical word, term yeah. for it. Okay, yeah, and, I, and there's Fair enough. And, and, and sometimes my mind at this hour does not remember words Friday I should. Afternoons, yeah, in particular. Yeah. But uh, uh, collagen synthesis uh, of any sort. So fi I mean, the fibrosis thing just kind of got me off on a rabbit trail there. But regardless, um, what people probably don't realize when it comes to how we market the word collagen is that from our very inception, we're producing collagen. Um, all the time. And a lot of it is because we are in a world where we're constantly being injured. You know, we have, you know, radiation, we have cuts and bruises, we have, um, you know, what's uh, ionizing, well, that's radiation. And so these things uh, cause damage to our tissues and our body has to repair them. So we're constantly remodeling ourselves. Um, and when we're younger, we, we have just the ability to do it better. Um, that's just like we were talking about with the tissue engineering that I did as a grad student is, or as a postdoc, is that we are able to, when we're younger, just do it faster and better. And as we age, we just can't catch up. We can't keep up with it. And that's why we start to see the signs of aging mm -hmm. because we're accumulating damage and our body is trying to catch up. And so there's, it's going to prioritize. And it's like I said, uh, I've said in other lectures that, you know, if you injure the body with like put a hole in it or something, it's going to fix it. But if it doesn't see anything leaking out or leaking in, it's probably not going to prioritize that and say, um, it's okay, I'll just leave it as is, you know? So injuries uh, can expedite collagen deposition as well as other things, um, tissue formation, tissue uh, remodeling. And so collagen is just a part of that. And that's one of the things that I want us to focus on is that it's not as simple as more collagen equals better, um, that any particular collagen is, uh, you know, the, the, the key to eternal youth. Um, and so it all is intertwined. And so when we talk about the remodeling process, we do know there's several collagens involved. Mm -hmm. And so you've, you've all heard this kind of cascade and all that. So, uh, well, I guess, Angela, what is your understanding of tissue remodeling and which collagens are good, which collagens are bad, or is that a thing? Mm, well, again, uh, you know, this is going to go back to my industry knowledge and, and in particular the devices that we work with. And so I think of tissue remodeling as creating injury um, to remodel the skin, which includes deposition of collagen. And depending on the level of inflammation involved in that process depends on the type of collagen 
or the structure, I should say, of the collagen. Because I think it all, in my mind, it's all collagen. Starts out in the in the the, the wound healing cascade. It starts out as collagen three, and then progresses upon remodeling to collagen one. But then the structure of that collagen can be very different depending on, according to my knowledge, according to the inflammation that was involved in that process. So if it was an inflammatory process, it could be more of a scar tissue type formation, which the collagen would then be more of a parallel format. If it was non-inflammatory, then it would be more prone to a natural form of collagen, which would look more like a, a basket weave form of collagen. Okay. So... You know, that's, you know, that's just my knowledge in terms of working with the devices that we've worked with over the years of, of tissue remodeling. And I'm sure there's a lot more than that, but that's my sure. limited knowledge. Okay. And Brian, what's your reaction to that kind of? Well, it's pretty good. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, when you think about it, uh, for, for scars, if it's something that's very traumatic to the body, it's wanting to repair that very quickly. It throws down, produces a lot of collagen, throws it down there trying to um, pr protect the body and protect that particular tissue. Um, what you're talking about is trying to do it where such that you're getting a increase in activity without it actually being a stress response or a strong st stress response uh, to a to an injury that uh, needs to be repaired uh, very quickly and somewhat haphazardly. Um, and so that, what you're trying to do is um, get that response is towards uh, collagen three and moving towards collagen one. So, but uh, the other thing I think that needs to remember is that collagen has a very long half-life and that, uh, you know, if you look at collagen that's found in the dermis, uh, I think they talk about it lasting for uh, 14 to 17 years. And so it can pick up a lot of damage and it, it doesn't turn over very much. And so I think um, uh, at least, uh, um, you know, that collagen is um, produced relatively rare. Um, so when you do start slowing down as towards uh, the production of it, uh, it actually becomes quite noticeable and that's why you get the aging to occur is that uh, it's not produced very um, immensely or, or, or intensely as towards, um, and so uh, what you're trying to do is stimulate that uh, that response. Yeah, and I think also <clears throat> what you said to kind of a, 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 a person that is kind of a novice in um, cell biology and such, it, it's helpful like to say things like basket weave pattern, mm -hmm. lab pattern, but in reality it's, it's kind of more um, of a, you know, when it's scar tissue, it's just more disorganized. Okay. Um, where it's more organized in normative tissue, and that just has to do with the the nature of what the cell is trying to do when it's when it's rec uh, recovering from an injury, and is the type of injury. How quickly it needs to respond, according to what Brian just said. It's, mm -hmm. It Sometimes. depends on how quickly, how urgent is the situation. How quickly does it need to respond? In other words, if it can respond more slowly, then it can organize better. And then how traumatic the event was, how much damage is there that's right. that forces mm -hmm. a, forces the body to respond very quickly and, again, create something that's more disorganized. Is right. That but it's also the environment, like yeah. what the environment of the tissue is at the time of the restructuring. And so we know that uh, in certain animals, they don't uh, – fibrosis uh, in the scar tissue doesn't really happen because of the way that their body reacts to the injury, similar to fetal tissue. We've talked about that in the past. And so we, we don't want to get too bogged down in remodeling today because we, we did talk about that previously. But as far as collagen is concerned, when you talk about the structure of the collagen and such, it's really the way in which the body's laying it down and using it. It's not making, you know, there's no necessarily bad or good collagen. Uh, it's more about how the body is using those molecules um, and then, uh, you know, how those, the body is reacting to those molecules long term. And so... Um, what what's the other part of what you wanted to cover on that? Well, I think that what are we doing on a daily basis? We talked about injury. I think uh -huh. everybody gets trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked a, a touched on a little bit about some of the aesthetic procedures that are done that trigger less trauma, but, or that produce, uh, that have less trauma, but still produce a, mm -hmm. a beneficial effect on collagen. But what are just the general public in daily life? What are some of the things that consumers are doing on a daily basis that are degrading collagen? In the I, think, body. I think you if might we, have one of them in your mind. So why don't you just tell us which one you're thinking well, of? Well, we kind of touched on sugar. Sugar is okay. one of them. Which you told us not to talk about. Yeah, but we need to kind of <laughs> talk about it. Right. Um, you know, ex ex um, excess sugar intake. Mm -hmm. That's one of them, right? So in what way does sugar or excess sugar degrade collagen? What's happening in that case? Okay, well, I don't know if you want to call it degrading. Essentially what it does is it cross-links that collagen so it no longer is um, movable or flexible. Supple. 
supple. Yep. Um, and so it actually, you know, uh, if you think about a, a swinging bridge, uh, you know, that needs to move back and forth because of the movement of, of the earth or whatever the case may be, now you're making it rigid, then it, it tends to, to make it break or not have a, a real function in, anymore. Um, and so um, that's what really happens with, uh, with the large amounts of sugar. It's called a, a, a advanced glycation in products um, or mm -hmm. browning reaction, I think is the other term for it. It's the same reaction that occurs uh, when you brown a chicken or a turkey. It's towards that skin, or it turns kind of a, or a yellowish brown. Um, and that's what actually happens to your collagen within your skin. Well, that's not a nice thought, Brian. Okay, well, well I, I was trying to bring a little Thanksgiving uh, <laughs> thought to it. It's a little early. Uh, um, <laughs> so you talked about there being 28 different types of collagen. So does that, does sugar affect some forms of the collagen? Because you talked about some collagen is just weighing the skin down to the bones. That mm -hmm. sounds like it more does. when you're talking about keeping a bridge. Now, suddenly my tendons aren't working as well as they could have because mm -hmm. I was an excessive sugar intaker over the years. Sugar is intaker. That, <laughs> is that the case? Or yeah. is it? does it affect all tw does sugar excess sugar sh affect all 28 types of collagen to some equally? extent they will but but more th so than than others so okay um but uh, again the, the other part that is bad about the sugars is that uh, with that cross-linking no longer can be broken down or broken down easily by we've talked about before matrix material uh, proteinases or mmps and uh, that's necessary to to get them to be removed so that they can put new uh, and more functional collagen fibers uh, in the place of old fibers and so um, that's okay, so it does not allow, when it gets to that point and it's no longer pliable or supple, right. the collagen is not as easily broken down by the body when it's supposed to be broken down right. and degraded and, and moved on so that, um, I won't say fresh new collagen, <laughs> but I will say healthy collagen uh, can be, can, can be right. added, correct? Yeah, and there's been a quite a bit of work on what's called uh, glycation, in, uh, uh, glycation breakers or what would break those advanced glycation in products. Um, so there's... Uh, been uh, a number of different uh, treatments trying to, for heart attack. You brought up the fact of vessels in the heart mm -hmm. uh, because, again, that they'll get cross-linked as well in regarding sugar uh, intake. Become and, stiff. And stiff, and so they're no longer as functional as they used to be and lead towards, uh, you know, uh, insufficiencies with, re regarding the heart and, and cardiac output. Um, so they're trying to find things that would, would break those, those sugar cross-links. Uh, and that's also been done in the skin in a number of cases. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's also some areas in which people are going into for anti-aging uh, benefits or improvements of, of skin uh, pliability. Right. And glycation is, is something very advanced as far as, you know, skin issues. It's very, you typically very hard to treat because it's very advanced as far as uh, skin damage. And so uh, when you see something that can help it, it's actually quite a, a big deal. So when I think of glycation, if I'm visibly seeing that on the skin, I'm, I'm seeing almost like a cross-hatched mm -hmm. pattern on the skin, yeah. right? And Oof. that is difficult to that's treat. When it's, that's when it's pretty advanced. It, yeah. That's yeah. when it's advanced. And the, is that always caused from sugar or sugar is a part of that, of what can cause that glycation? Well, for a glycation, I think it is sugar. That's why it's called okay. the glycation. Not, okay. We're not talking only like table sugar, but that's right. why glycation, it comes from like anything gly. Is, yeah. is sugar related, but sugars are a Ripos, type of molecule, glyco, not glucose, yeah. simply glucose from yeah. table sugar. Okay. So but there's that gets broken down into individual uh, subcomponents of sugar, um, and those get uh, cross-linked between the proteins or between the cross or the fibers of the, of the protein, and so it essentially builds a lattice structure that they no longer move. And you want to have these proteins to be able to move because you want your skin to be able to move, or your joints to be able to move, or your tendons and the mm -hmm. like. In the way that they're designed to, yeah. yeah. Correct. So a diabetic is going to have more glycation of the skin and than a normal patient because their body's not able to process right. sugar you can, in you the You can same think of way. it also like when somebody gets their spine fused and they can't move as much. It's, it's a similar thing. When you right. fuse certain things together, it just reduces mobility and it changes the, the, the way that that particular thing functions. Um, so uh, that's, that's one way in which, you know, collection of, of um, damaged collagen can add, contribute to aging. Right. Um, and when we're younger, we have the ability to just remodel that much, much easier, much better. Um, and so it's not that we're uh, damaging, or damaging ourselves necessarily more. It's that we're accumulating the damage over the years. Over the years uh, and okay. then we just don't have the ability to fix it as we used to. And and it gets worse the, and worse. Yeah, and diabetics, you start seeing glycation in products or advanced glycation in products uh, in their 20s and early 30s. 
So they start uh, seeing having rigidity in their tissues much, much earlier than uh, someone's able to maintain their sugar uh, levels. So. Right. Yes. Okay. So ex ex excess sugar is one of them. UV damage. I think we touched on that a little bit. Is a form of trauma that that's right because collagen or, or mm -hmm. negatively. And that's through several avenues. You know, it's not just th just because uh, UV radiation damages one thing in particular. It also causes upregulation of certain things that actually can eat away at uh, these structural proteins. Right. Um, and so then there's one that. It also um, actually uh, decreases the actual production of collagen. So it actually increases mm -hmm. the enzyme activity towards degradation, but then also shuts down or, or greatly reduces the production of collagen. Right, so, because they're, then, they're tied to degradation, not production, so it's going to be a feedback loop. Yeah. So as you're younger and you're at build, still building collagen at a fast rate, you can actually slow down that process Correct. by excessive sun exposure. Correct. So there you have it. So the protein there goes down, the production goes down, the degradation goes up. Uh, and, and the damage uh, goes up. So again, I've got to explain this to my kids okay. tonight. Well, there's there's <laughs> lots of reasons why. As they uh, wouldn't wear sunscreen on the beach in Barcelona mm -hmm. last week. Okay, um, and so one of the things, uh, like for instance, I just handed uh, Brian a paper when we were getting started here. You know, there's there's a, a study that talks about uh, UV damage to the sebacites, which is the oil producing cells of the uh, the oil glands of the skin, or uh, that produce sebum and, and the different oils and such. And they actually has, uh, uh, they've actually showed um, some sort of tie between the UV damage to the sebacites and changing the things that the sebacite produces that actually affects the melanocyte and causes melasma, as well as also the fibroblasts and changes the way the fibroblasts act as well, which, which are the cells that produce the collagen mostly mm -hmm. uh, in the skin. And so, again, there's, there's not only direct ways of the way that um, we can damage collagen, but indirect ways as well through uh, whether it's UV damage or a bad diet, which I do want to talk about um, diet and how diet affects uh, uh, the collagen in our body. And then we can get into, because we only have a few minutes left, supplementation of mm -hmm. collagen. Mm -hmm. But um, collagen in our body uh, through our, our diet, uh, we have to remember, and this is where I bring it back to what? The microbiome. Uh, and so oh, here we go. Again. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. goes back to the microbiome. But the thing is, the microbiome does play a large role in the way that we react to our diet, uh, as well as the substances that they secrete can actually, they actually have bacteria in our skin and in our gut that secrete or cause our body to secrete collagenase. Yeah. And so collagenase is uh, anything with ACE means breaking removal down. or breaking down. Yeah. So the breaking down of coll collagen is collagenase. And so um, that is actually something that if we don't treat the microbes in our body correctly, and that can be just our, that could be our diet or also the skincare that we use, is it can cause certain reactions of the bacteria there uh, to produce things like either hy hyaluronidase um, or collagenase. Um, and these things actually play a, a role in the way that our, our skin and, and our, the rest of our body can actually age. And part of that is uh, when we have diet that causes our gut microbes to secrete inflammatory signals that can also trigger um, uh, proteins and enzymes in our body to break down collagen and other extracellular matrix proteins. So it's important that we note that um, it's not just sun damage. It's also diet. And when you mm -hmm. talked about sugar and glycation, that's manifested on the skin. That's not the only reason that sugar is bad. Sugar also can cause the fermentation of sugar in our guts can cause inflammatory signals. Mm -hmm. So can dairy products. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's making Jeez. me never want to eat it again. Right. And yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so, and, and then the other thing is uh, we also have to realize that our diet, um, which now we're going to go into the supplementation, mm -hmm. is going to affect genders differently. Oh boy, here we go. You're looking at me. <laughs> well, this is where, go you know, ahead, when, I, with it. when I talk about, you know, skin aging, uh, we, we do know that a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on how thick the dermis is. And they say, you know, you're going to thicken your dermis by collagen deposition. So you get a filler, they call it a biostimulator. And they say, and, and my question to them is, do you think that the, the collagen stimulation is going to happen in the dermis? Is that, I mean, what is, what's the point of you collagen, calling it a collagen stimulator? Because um, that's not the, the case it causes fibrosis that coats that filler and that adds to the volumization possibly a long-term volumization or something but not necessarily uh thickening the dermis and that feeds into even supplementation is that 
uh, when we do these things, we know that women, especially after menopause, their skin um, does reduce in its thickness significantly. And men, it happens over a longer term, but that comes down to when you look at hormones. Right. Men have uh, the same phenomena as women do with hormones. It just takes a lot longer, longer. and it tapers a lot better. Is that better. epidermis and dermis that both thin out? Uh, Probably mostly dermis, because okay. um, well, the epidermis more, isn't that thick. Well, actually, more towards the epidermis will come thinner um, as you as you become older. Well, both will. Well, the, but the dermis actually, if you look at the lower or the um, uh, part of the dermis, it actually becomes thicker because it builds up all the collagen, the non-functional collagen. So it actually, if you look at the difference between the papillary yeah. and the reticular layer of the dermis, uh, I, I will grant you that the papillary dermis becomes thinner, mm. but the reticular area of the dermis becomes thicker because it actually has a buildup of collagen, typically collagen that's non-functional. Okay, well, I would. we, we, we don't have enough time to okay. really go through that too much, that. Okay. but I will tell you that I've done cadaver studies and ultrasound studies that show that women uh, over the age of 50 or 60, uh, I've seen dermis as uh, thin as half a millimeter. Oh, yeah. Um, and so uh, while I concede that a lot of it's probably non-functional. <laughs> well, in the, um, in the papillary dermis, the top part of the dermis, which is usually a little bit thicker, becomes essentially non-existent. Nothing, yes. Yeah. So I, I just maybe that's the thing is that maybe you're just, just saying that that lower part becomes non-functional and then the, it just shrinks to nothing. Right, because the, the top layer it doesn't. But the yeah. overall th thickness uh, I've observed in my own right. research to thin significantly. T t totally agree. It just, you know, if you, if you subdivide it, uh, there's some that sure. get th thicker, but the the larger section in normal tissue, the papillary dermis, becomes much smaller. Uh, and that's what you're seeing. Is and for those overall, who don't know jargon, again, papillary is the upper part of the yeah. dermis. Uh, the reticular would be the lower part. Right. Well, all I can tell you right now is I want to rush off to the health food store and buy everything that says collagen on okay, it. Okay, well, I'm that was a great, <laughs> good segue. I'm going to get segue. the supplements. <laughs> don't um, stop listening, people, because, because you know, we're about to blow this out of the water. <laughs> Um, no, so that's a great segue. Thank you for that, uh, Angela, because we should talk about this, especially in, re in regards to um, male versus female. And so, Alan, I don't know if you can put my my uh, my screen up uh, for everybody to see, but for those of you who are listening, I'll describe it. But I, d I, I saw this in a publication when I was looking at this uh, idea of supplementation uh, of collagen. So basically, this study shows that when you look at the macronutrients that people ingest uh, between men and women, that uh, when, when you give a huge amount of protein or supplement with protein, um, the men actually see a significant increase in the dermis as far as thickness. Women do not see any thickne wow. thickening of the dermis. It's actually the carbohydrates that fluctuate the skin thickness of women, and it's because of the fatty tissue, not the dermis. They need more f fat because they lose fat and volume in their face. Right, so and so it's actually well, But we're not supposed to different. be having a lot of carbohydrates. That also puts excess fat in other areas. That's correct. It does. Uh. But that's where, that's where you, you just have to concede that it, it's not across the board the same, you know, uh, men and women. And so when you take, we talked about the animal... Uh, models, the, the hypothetical where you say collagen three does this. And so I'm going to go do that too. It may not be the same between men and women. So for a man, he might get a great response. And for women, maybe not as much like a man uh, in this particular uh, figure that I was going to show uh, the high protein males, actually there's the fatty layer actually shrunk um, almost to nothing where the dermis got significantly thicker versus the control or low protein where low protein, it didn't change anything really. Um, and then the high protein for the females uh, versus the control, it shrunk a little bit of the fatty layer, but the dermis didn't change at all. So does this mean, in fact, I cannot go to the health store this evening <laughs> and buy collagen drinks and supplements and expect change in my skin? Well, you, this is, again, let's talk about it a little further because um, I also read another uh, publication, and I want to hear your guys' response to this, is that they took soy uh, protein and then they took soy um, peptides. So again, the protein is the, mo the large complete molecule and the peptides are the broken down ones. And so college, soy collagen, uh, uh, soy collagen? Oh, well, now, got, now I'm doubting okay. myself because I don't, uh, Just it was soy protein, so, so pr uh, okay. but I, I thought it was collagen, but now I don't think soy produces collagen, no, but, they don't. um, so but anyway, the peptides versus the protein and they found that the peptide actually produced um, a lot better effects on the skin than the whole protein. 
Now, did they denature the whole protein as far as with heat, or is it? Uh, uh, they hydrolyzed it. Okay. So, what's what's your thoughts on that? It uh, is just protein. Well, I know they've done work in looking at uh, skin lightening agents as far as using soy and soy proteins. And again, if it was um, native uh, soy protein, that means that again, it still contained the three D structure. Uh, it worked, but if it was actually cooked, um, then it lost its, its 3D functionality or th structure and lost its functionality. Yeah, that's, that's you said that was ingesting? Uh, that was actually um, correct. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, because I think about we that. know that proteins, when they're heated, will lose their structure right. and such. It's called denaturing. Right, yeah. Um, and so you'll do that to get an enzyme, kill an enzyme or whatever. Mm -hmm. But regardless, yes, if you go to the health food store, it is debatable whether collagen will, whether it's hydrolyzed, which means it's broken down or can be absorbed easier, or whether it's whole, like in just meats or whatnot, is gonna make all that much difference other than just increasing your protein intake. Now, there are um, some studies that I could not find um, uh, them for today, but there was one in particular that claimed that when they ingested, when ant these rats ingested uh, collagen, it actually went and was deposited in the, the collagenous areas like mm -hmm. the joints and the skin and such. I can't find it. I don't know whether that's, it was done by the company that sells that product. So, you know, I'm not saying that's always bad thing, but it's the only time I've seen it uh, substantiated to that level. Um, in a review article that I read today, more or less, uh, it said there's some evidence that shows that collagen ingestion, ingestion can add to things like elasticity of skin, but I don't believe it's been substantiated that it's not due to just more intake of protein or a better diet, you know, because if you're ingesting more liquids and proteins, you're probably not ingesting as much other things because you're gonna be satiated and more full. And so these are the things that, uh, at this point I would say, I'm not sure that that whole like philosophy of, if my eye hurts, go get something that's shaped like an eye. Mm -hmm. um, if my mm -hmm. skin is bad, go eat some skin from animals, which is that kind of Eastern philosophy, ancient Eastern philosophy, right. if my heart's bad, so eat a dear heart. It sounds like out the the jury is still out on those types of products. That right. Maybe, maybe not. Would I be better off just doing what we said we shouldn't be doing? The excessive sugar, the UV damage. If I were a smoker, you know, stopping the right. smoking, better a diet, healthier diet. Would I be exercise. better off exercise and doing all of those things if I wanted to increase? collagen or at least stop the the de degradation of my own collagen to look and feel younger longer yes i'd be better off doing that versus in, um, yeah, investing in something having a steak once in a while or whatever enjoying that part of it but moderation uh, yeah right? and frankly moderation. other than hurting your wallet getting yeah. a collagen supplement isn't going to hurt you per se at least not that we know of it's just not necessarily going to do anything that's specific to skin uh, that we know of either. Right. Um, now, that being said, some people swear by them. Great. If you're willing to pay for it, go for it. Um, but I would say I would not myself invest in that. I, again, would su uh, invest with, because for me, the, the thing that causes aging is not lack of collagen. It's the whole system degrading because the of those senescent cells, put it in. the genetic um, you know, aging and such. And so to address your skin... I would say I'd invest more, and I do, in uh, anti-aging, like senolytic molecules like apigenin and NMN and stuff like that. And we can have a whole other uh, podcast on some of that mm -hmm. stuff in the future. But those are the things that are kind of more, in my opinion, the future of anti-aging. And then the other things that, that we know, and, and we'll, we'll end on this note, is... Still, there are procedures that you can go in and have, such as the ones that our devices create, that, you, that can help to increase collagen deposition, correct? And, um, and patients could still be investing in those. And topical agents and microbiome care, for instance, there's still other things that you could be doing that have shown some success in collagen, correct? Yes, correct. And I, I will, I'm not saying you can't do anything. I'm just saying that I would not in, invest in, in, in collagen right. drinks and such. I would invest in things that legitimately are shown to kind of move the needle holistically. Um, you know, and there's going to always be a little bit of, um, you know, uh, we, 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 we're learning more so we can do better. And we'll probably change stances every, you know, so often because we know more at that point. And so for right now, I agree with you. There are things that you can do. We have to, we have to concede that some things actually mask aging, mm -hmm. while other things actually um, 
are going to de-age. Re reverse Yeah, aging. reverse aging. And those things are very few and far between right now and limited, but we're getting there. Well, that and is so, encouraging. Yeah, and that's where we have to stop okay. it here. Um, so uh, we could talk about that all day. We can. And uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for your eyes and ears. We hope you learned something. And uh, you can reach us on the Crown website at crownlaboratories.com. Or if you want to reach me personally, go on to my Instagram at dr.t.hitchcock. Uh, and uh, you can communicate with me there. Um, we uh, will see you next time. Bye. Thank you.